We, we want to understand very clearly what's being said in this little section. That those who receive the right to be called the children of God are not those who simply have a physical connection. It is not through their first birth, not through the bloodline, not through the will of the flesh, but by God initiating a wonderful new program in which His Son comes and offers eternal life. And the Holy Spirit of God, working within, convicts us and brings us to the point where we are prepared to receive Christ as personal Savior. In our introductory study, we thought about the fact that when the Lord Jesus arrived on the planet, there were people who were the spiritual children of Abraham by faith, already living in the land of Israel. And they had, like the patriarch, a true and vital relationship with Jehovah, though they hadn't yet met Jesus. As the Lord Jesus would later say, you believe in God, believe also in me. That's John chapter 14 and verse 1. But a new society was about to be birthed, the church, which would be constituted of both Jew and Gentile, brought in on equal footing through the work of Christ. Uh, some of those who previously would have been considered what we call the wife of Jehovah, Jeremiah 31 verses 1 to 5, and Ezekiel 16 verse 8, Hosea 2 verses 14 to 23, they're now going to be transferred by the Father to the care of his Son, who is called the Savior of the body, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. So this new composite group uh, would share a common life, and this was made possible through the death of Christ. Uh, one of the things that he did, we read in chapter 2 of Ephesians, verses 14 to 16, Quote, he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition, of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, that is, believing Jews and Gentiles, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. That's Ephesians 2 verses 14 to 16. So this is a mystery. That is an idea that has been withheld from the human race until the appropriate moment when God revealed it. And you can see that in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 1 to 9. Now, one of the difficult verses that we read about in the Gospel of John uh, can be quickly misunderstood if we don't grasp this idea. So, listen to these verses. Uh, the salvation that God provides in the present age involves the Holy Spirit wooing us to Christ. God does not give us, the Father does not give us to the Son in salvation. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So listen to these words. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes and where it goes so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That's chapter 3, verses 5, 6, and 8. And so this is a common theme, right? In chapter 6 and verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. So no one should doubt the strategic role the Father has in salvation. We have seen and testified that the Father sent the Son as Savior of the world. 1 John 4, 14. 
And Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, also describes his blessing of us, the one who comes from heaven. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from him. But clearly, the Holy Spirit is the one who has been sent into the world to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Chapter 16 and verse 8 of John's Gospel. So he brings us to the certain conviction of our need of salvation and woos us to Christ. So, these people who put their trust in the Lord are regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God, Titus 3 and verse 5, and placed in Christ. So, I think this is essential that we understand this, because we're going to read about the Father and his role with certain people who are brought to the Lord Jesus. We should not misunderstand and think somehow that this is speaking about the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not. So, let's ask this question then. Who are Abraham's children? According to the New Testament, this new covenant, who are they? So the Lord Jesus drew a careful distinction between those who considered themselves the progeny of Abraham because of their physical association and those who were Abraham's true children by faith. So, uh, this was a great irritation to the members of the Jewish audiences that Jesus was speaking to. They considered themselves Group A, those who already belonged to the Father, because they were the physical children of Abraham. But Jesus explained that the proof they were not the fathers was that they didn't recognize the Son. My father and I are so alike, he said, that, quote, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. That's chapter 8 and verse 19. But, he goes on to add graciously, there's no reason you can't now believe and become part of, shall we say, group B. This, those who have discovered Christ, who didn't ever know the father. And instead of coming to the Son by being given by the Father, they are going to come to the Father by coming through the Son. So, as a little aside, it's helpful to notice the Apostle Paul also distinguishes two subgroups of those who are Abraham's children. In Romans chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Notice carefully there are two and only two groups of Abraham's children. First he says, quote, the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised. All right? These are Gentiles who, because they have the faith of Abraham, become his children through faith. So he is the father of all believing Gentiles. And then second he is, quote, the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had. End quote. So he's the father of Jews as well, but not all Jews. He is the father, in a spiritual sense, of those who are of the circumcision who also have the faith of Abraham. And so it is by faith that both True Jews and Gentiles are linked to Abraham, not simply by physical birth. And we'll see this, of course, very clearly in chapter 3. So let's think about transitional passage 1. And we're, we're going to read John 1, verses 11 to 13. You can follow along in your own Bible. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Again, that's John chapter 1, verses 11 to 13. So, one of the distinctive titles of God's people in the Gospel of John is this simple phrase, his own. Uh, we're introduced to it here in the book, and here you'll notice that the his own are the Jewish people. 
But later on, when we come to chapter 13 and verse 1, we read, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, and that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Obviously, these two groups of his own must be different. Those in John 1 did not want him. They did not receive him. Whereas those in John 13 through 17 were committed in their hearts to him. Judas accepted. And so the first group were his own through natural birth. And the second group uh, were his own through spiritual birth. In his prayer to his father, he explains, quote, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. That's chapter 17 and verse 6. So, this crucial concept of the transfer from the Father to the Son, we'll discuss in the next section as well. And we'll also revisit this first His own when we look at the branches in John 15. So, suffice it to say, there is a decided shift during this time period from the Lord seeking the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24, and when he puts forth his own sheep out of Judaism, the ones who knew his voice and followed him, as we see in John 10. We mustn't be too quick to lump together groups of people in John, even when they may seem to be described in similar terms, such as his own and the sheep. They may respond to him in very different ways. So, we, we want to understand very clearly what's being said in this little section. That those who receive the right to be called the children of God are not those who simply have a physical connection. It is not through their first birth, not through the bloodline, not through the will of the flesh, but by God initiating a wonderful new program in which his son comes and offers eternal life and the Holy Spirit of God working within convicts us and brings us to the point where we are prepared to receive Christ as personal Savior. Wonderful understanding when we grasp this. He, he came to his own, the Jewish people, most of them wouldn't have him, but as many as received him. To them he gave the right to become children or sons of God, even to those who believe in his name. So, to believe is to receive. And those who receive the Lord Jesus are those who believe his claims, who believe what he says about their need as a poor sinner, and who believe what he says about his offer of eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and a reconciliation to God so that we become his children. Those who believe this are those who receive him. And when we receive him, we indeed are brought into this spiritual lineage as the spiritual children of Abraham. And may the Lord help us to understand these fundamental ideas that the Lord Jesus is explaining in the Gospel by John.